Hey all, here OS Reviews. Today we're taking a revisited look at the Sony Xperia XA2 here in 2023. This was a mid-tier smartphone released back in 2018, making it about five years old. So the reason why we're taking a look back at this device isn't necessarily because of the specs, which were never really remarkable, but rather because of A, the design, which I think still looks quite interesting, and also B, this now is one of the least expensive phones that you can purchase which is capable of running Selfish OS that's based on a newer updated version of Mego which is also found on the Nokia N9. We will be revisiting the Selfish component though in a dedicated video just taking a look at that piece. So in this video we will be focusing primarily on this phone out of the box with that Android experience and see how it holds up if using it directly. This phone has a Snapdragon 630 octa-core processor clock at 2.2 gigahertz, complemented here with 3 gigabytes of RAM. It's not the most powerful specs in the world, but it suffices for a entry-level slash mid-tier phone. The XA2 you can now find for under 100 bucks, sometimes as low as $60 if you're shopping around, as long as you're willing to make do with a more conventional 16 by 9 aspect ratio display. Design elements like the boxy shape of the phone is very reminiscent of previous Xperia devices that they've been making for a while now. The only difference on the XA line though was they really reduced the bezel size at least on the left and right hand edges of the phone compared to on other models and even more expensive flagships at the time including the Sony XZ line such as the XZ2 Compact that we also did a throwback review on last year, you can see has ironically much more conventional slash larger bezels on the edges. The Sharp Aquos Crystal took the same concept and made it even more dramatic by having the top also bezel-less as well, but it's going after a similar overall aesthetic, I would say, also from a Japanese manufacturer. And then ZTE with their Nubia Z17 Lite also employed a similar frameless side bezel as you can see there. So in contrast, the XA2 was definitely not alone in trying out this concept, and I think it still makes it look quite elegant and beautiful out of the 16 by 9 aspect ratio phones as a result. The top also housed the Sony logo, your piece, and an 8 megapixel front-facing camera which had a very wide angle lens. The frame is also constructed out of aluminum that was also kind of rare for mid-tier budget phones, uh, but it made the phone actually feel very premium in the hands. With that being said, it's not exactly a unibody design because the back is still made out of a plastic material and the metal also has a few kind of edges and how they fit together. It supports a micro SD card to expand the 32 gigs of built-in storage, a traditional SIM card slot. The top here house a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, always nice to see, and again continues with that metal design with these pretty sharp corners and dramatic chamfered edges. The phone itself can actually stand upright on the top and bottom without anything because of how large this surface is, and it does look quite good, although one downside is all of this metal with these sharp edges definitely cuts into your fingers a little bit when you're holding it, so it may not be the most comfortable design in the world compared to a rounded surface. Now on the right hand spine there's access to a conventional power key volume rocker also made out of metal and feel quite responsive, and then like most Sony phones it does have a dedicated camera shutter key, which I absolutely love, so you're able to quickly jump into the camera interface, half tap to focus, and then all the way down to capture an image. Now the camera itself was also not shabby. It was using a 23 megapixel shooter with a dual tone LED flash uh, that was actually quite detailed in terms of a mid-tier performer and it also offered other connectivity options pretty fully stacked for a mid-tier phone including NFC, GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and of course 4G LTE for the time. You can also tell the presence of the optical fingerprint scanner which worked really well. The placement also felt comfortable and easy to reach although it is a little bit of a shame that Sony kind of skewed away from continuing with their side-mounted fingerprint scanner placement. Now the very bottom here has a 18 watt USB Type-C charging port and then a loudspeaker. The XA2 did have a larger battery which was rated at 3,300 milliamp hours which for a 5.2 inch phone is actually quite good coupled with the relatively energy efficient chipset. This is actually a phone that even now after all these years can still last you I would say about a day and a half to two days before you have to really recharge it again unless you are pressing it super hard.
Now taking a look at the software experience next, it is running on a relatively stylish version of Android 8.0 Oreo out of the box. It definitely has much more customization going on from Sony and a fair share of maybe bloatware or really the kitchen sink approach similar to what Samsung does on their phones. But it's not too bad. Over the years, Sony have already gone better at making the experience slightly more clean and we have mostly a overall polished enough experience on here. There are certain design elements from Sony including that oversized clock widget that they were definitely ahead of the curve because now on Android 12, Android 13, this is the way how a lot of those stock devices are displaying the time and being able to customize how that clock worked was something that the Xperia UI gave you access to in advance compared to what stock Android today also offers. So they had something called the Xperia rings or hoops that you're able to customize with all of these vibrant different colors. And if you're satisfied with an option here, what you'll see is once you turn on the phone and kind of unlock it with your fingerprints, it also flashes with that circle getting larger, which I think is just a very cool subtle touch, including how the pages can be transitioned, the grids of icons, want whether you want to make them larger or smaller, offer quite a bit of advanced customization. Now one final note here about this display is the Gorilla Glass 4 is slightly curved, so if you're looking at it here from the side, it almost bubbles upwards as it's moving from the edge to the center and then slopes off again towards the two sides. And the result is you do get a pretty seamless experience as you're scrolling along Jumping into the performance side of things and going into the camera here first, you could capture video up to 4K resolution, have access to a manual mode as you can see here, so quite good, although it is a single lens camera of course, so you won't find additional tricks like a wide angle or telephoto, something like that. Now by default the 23 megapixel mode is by f is in the 4 by 3 aspect ratio, so for 16 by 9 it goes down a little bit to 20, but still plenty sharp I have to admit. And if you go down further to 12 megapixels, you are able to now toggle on HDR to slightly boost the contrast of your images. The front facing camera is surprisingly a highlight just because it is a very wide angle lens as you can see there. I can also reduce it to a slightly more normal degree angle. Other creative AR modes that you could play around with can also be accessed. And when it comes to the overall quality of images, as aforementioned, when there is good enough lighting, it can still capture impressive enough shots, especially considering a phone that is nearing five years old. That's where the higher megapixel count, I think, is still doing a great job in terms of giving you plenty of detail as you zoom and crop in. One thing to keep in mind though is that the higher megapixel count you will be taking up close to 21 megabytes per photo compared to 12 megapixels will take up around 7 megabytes of space. Just keep in mind that it's going to fall apart once you start taking it into really low light environments since there is no dedicated night mode unfortunately. You have Sony's own music player app which I actually do really like uh, just because Ironically enough, in the stock version of Android these days, unless you are trying out the file manager, there is no built-in offline music player. Everything is based off of streaming. So if you are still using your phone as kind of a MP3 player, it's still really useful, I have to admit. And that's where Sony's legacy in originally coming out with the kind of Walkman devices also comes into play and still works quite good. Again, this 5.2 inch display, I am quite impressed with, I have to say, not only because of the thin bezels on the sides, but because of how the colors do quite pop, although usually that's only activated when you're taking a look at photos and video content, but you can also fine adjust those properties per your liking, even the color gamut, and it gets you, again, plenty of granularity, despite not being an AMOLED screen with pure blacks, I have to say it's one of the better IPS LCD panels. Now aside from that, there's also a companion PS app, so if you are a PlayStation user, you're able to connect to the service and play some games. Some final bundled applications include Sony's movie creator and photo editing tools, which can be useful in a pinch if you are trying to combine multiple clips together on the phone. It's not too fancy, but it gets the job done. Facebook is pre-installed, but you can also uninstall that along with Amazon if you really aren't using these extra Extra services. You can also opt for something like Nova Launcher, for instance, if you really did want to go for an even more clean UI experience uh, that will give you access to the drag up drawer for additional applications. Some final gestures typical in Xperia's UI include dragging down to go through a universal search. Also, by default, they are using Sony's keyboard, but I've replaced this with the Gboard, which I personally prefer just a little bit more. 
Now, if anything, maybe the only spec that's showing its age a little bit would be the three gigabytes of RAM, which is still mostly fine. The UI still feels responsive enough and the Snapdragon 630 still mostly keeps up all right. But I would say keeping your apps to perhaps five to six in the background will get you an optimal experience. Let's take a quick look at how it fares watching back a video. So overall, the built-in speaker quality itself is quite good. It doesn't really peak or sound too tinny even at higher volume levels. The only downside is, yes, it's just a single speaker and can occasionally be a little easy to muffle or cover up with your hands. But again, you can always use standard headphones on here, always a win, or use wireless headphones instead if you prefer. So no problems in terms of reception strength remaining connected. And as a result, we're able to mostly load back videos and scrub between parts of the clip without having to wait too long either. So it still is perfectly serviceable if you're trying to watch YouTube, Netflix. A quick glimpse at how it handles web browsing next, I would say, also is doing surprisingly quite good. You can tell how pages there are loading back along pretty quickly, although certain news articles and ads are still taking a moment or two to fully load. It doesn't become a bother at all when it comes to scrolling. Everything still feels quite smooth and robust, even on a more complex page like this. Maybe the only con, and this is something we talked about on the XZ2 as well, was despite running on, say, Android 9 Pi with the updated OS, you still are not able to get rid of the soft keys for navigation, which some people prefer, but with Android Pie and newer, really by default, Android has started to support gestures for navigation, which I personally think would have made it look even more modern, especially with the curved glass display that they have here. So that's one thing about Sony's Xperia UI, which unfortunately gesture support was just not enabled despite the base Android OS having that capability. Again, there's really nothing from the Play Store that you aren't able to still install and load back. Even games like Asphalt or PUBG can be installed. The only downside is 32 gigs of memory by default is definitely a little bit low, especially after the OS has been installed that leaves you with mostly just around 15 gigs left for applications and media and photos. However, you can always augment that again with a micro SD card, which is at least appreciated. You have to be more conscious of waiting for things to load and you'll see more stuttering and some drop frames here and there. But for more simple titles, things like Stack and Tank, as you can see there, still presents itself as a very fluid and smooth experience. So that is more or less it as far as our revisited look at the Sony Xperia XA2. It was one of their last hurrahs at trying to make a mid-tier affordable phone that appealed to the masses with a more exciting design, which surprisingly even now still holds its own if you're using it for just casual uh, video watching, web browsing. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been a look back at the Sony Xperia XA2 here in 2023.